fist the dagger. G'day guys, JB here. Coming at you with a review for the first round of the 2023 NBA playoffs. A few upsets, a few surprises, and some really good outlooks at how each team is going to perform. On top of that, really good to see some consistent performance from some superstars around the league. Uh, and really good to see some players truly stepping up as well. Second round is going to be even more interesting. Uh, and I think your championship odds for teams have really, really uh, drastically changed based on not only the positive outcomes for teams, but certainly for those that are now no longer in the postseason. It's going to be an exciting second round, but there's a lot to unpack and a fair bit to unfold from the first round. So let's get into it. Let's get into a look back on round one of the 2023 NBA playoffs and of course we'll start with the first seed Milwaukee Bucks in the East going down in five games to the eighth seed Miami Heat Miami winning their way through from the playing tournament and got the job done in five games Jimmy Butler leading the way for the Heat 37 points six points six rebounds 4.8 assists 1.8 steals and 0.4 blocks on 2.4 turnovers shot 59.7 percent from the field 44.4 percent from deep and 70.8 from the stripe. Meanwhile, for the Bucks, they were without Giannis for pretty much two and a half of their five games. Chris Middleton, the pick of the bunch there for those who played all series and uh, wasn't necessarily the easiest of picks either. 23.8 points, 6.4 rebounds, 6.2 assists, 0.6 steals a game for Middleton on three turnovers, shot 46.5% from the field, 40.6% from deep and 86.7% from the free throw line. A couple of talking points to come out of this one, of course. Uh, the main one being Giannis only really playing around three games. Posted rounded averages of 23 points, 11 rebounds, five assists and a block. But one has to wonder what the team and how the squad and how the entire series would have looked if Giannis was healthy. Of course, we saw the Bucks' firepower there in game two without Giannis, which looked a good sign of things to come. But after that, it was genuinely the Jimmy Buckets and the Miami show. You've got to remember Miami also doing this without their second option in Tyler Hero. And if he is available later on in the postseason, that won't be until game one of the NBA Finals at least. Big uh, mark against Giannis though, of course, not wanting those free throws, not wanting to be in that game there. You know, the real concern being that 45.2% from the free throw line, and he took the second most free throw attempts for the series. Always been a gripe for Giannis. It's been a real big criticism, uh, and essentially he's only ever answered that once when he did answer it, he won a championship. I think he'll be back uh, tougher than ever next year. Fire under the belly. The last thing you want to do is give Giannis a reason to really have to uh, compete and push for a title. Obviously, the next point, Mike Budenholzer, what's going on with him? Uh, wouldn't say he had the greatest coaching performance, was pretty much outcoached by Spolstra, but Eric Spolstra, genuinely one of the 10 greatest coaches, in my opinion, in the history of the game, just what he's able to do with star talent, with raw talent, and uh, just really produce winning teams and winning systems. Uh, Budenholzer, clearly outcoached, and considering the way and the lay of the land in the NBA right now, the fact that you've got uh, salary caps changing, you've got contracts changing, you've got a genuine superstar with guys who are in the, you know, around that 30 years of age mark. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see just how that team looks. But really, it's Jimmy Butler's closing games of that series that really make a difference. It's 2-1. They need to at least look to get ahead, otherwise this series is going to be square. He drops 56 points. Uh, tied for the most points ever scored in a winning playoff game. Uh, of course, Elgin Baylor's 61, Jordan's 63, and Donovan Mitchell's 57. Uh, really, the well, they are the three highest scoring games in playoff history, but didn't get a win. Uh, so a big one there for Butler with 56. And 41 points again in that closeout game, that series closing game. Made the big plays, made the big shots. A want and a need to put the team on his back absolutely dominated in that one there and uh yeah jimmy himmy you know buckets pretty much 
He's the um, he's the best player for the Heat. There's no doubt about that right now. He's one of the best players in the league. I got him all NBA third team, and there's no reason why I don't think he can uh, continue to push on. Of course, at the time of recording, Heat one and one with the Knicks in round two. Butler missing game two with an ankle. There's no doubt about it, though. Jimmy Butler, he is the man in Miami, and he is uh, genuinely looking dangerous in the postseason. So the Heat move on, of course, taking on the Knicks right now. They are one and one. Over to our second series, though. Boston defeating Atlanta in six games to move into the second round, the second best team in the East. And now the number one ranked team in the postseason. Of course, they will have postseason, um, they will have playoff home advantage for every series now, including the finals if they make it. Defending Atlanta 4 to, as I said, best player for them in my mind, Jason Tatum. 27.2 points, 10 rebounds, 5.3 assists, 0.7 steals, and 1.2 blocks on 2.5 turnovers. Shot 45.3% from the field, 35% from deep, and 89.7% from the free throw line. On the other side of the ball, though, Trey Young trying to do his best. Uh, nothing more Trey loves than getting in the uh, postseason and playing in the opposition building. 29.2 points, 3.7 rebounds, 10.2 10 assists, 1.7 steals, and 0.7 blocks a game on four turnovers. The shooting splits to be desired, of course, 40.3% from the field, 33.3% from deep, but 86% from the line. Again, I just feel Boston should be the favourites coming out of the East right now. Again, though, as they stand, they are down 1-0 against the Philadelphia 76ers in the second round, and that being with uh, the MVP of the league, was recently announced, uh, not in that team. But I think Boston should still be the favourites. I just think 1-12 to and every lineup you can think of, they have the advantage there. And don't be surprised in game two if they're going to make a couple of adjustments there and really make things look good. Tatum and Brown for me, a combined 54 points, 15 rebounds, 8 assists, 2 steals and 2 blocks. 49.6 from the field, 40.9 from deep, 77.8 from the line. Still continuing to be the best perimeter duo or arguably the best duo in the league right now. Of course, a lot of arguments being made out in the West when Jamal Murray and Nikola Jokic playing well, uh, James Harden stepping up obviously in their first game against uh, Philadelphia and Boston, putting Philly up 1-0. You also have AD and LeBron playing well. You have Stephen Clay playing well. You know, a lot of duos doing a lot of things around the league, Brunson and Randall. But for me, I think Tatum and Brown are probably close, if not on top of that one there. And for all the faults that he has, Trey Young continuing to thrive on being the baddest man in the opposition's gym in a big game. He loves it in New York City. He loved it in Philadelphia. He's now started to love it in Boston. Of course, they're out in the first round. A lot of questions being asked, of course, when you consider that he's on the potentially on the trade block or on the move. Coach is fired. Players unhappy. You know, trade talks as well. So we'll see what happens there. But there's no doubt about it. Trey Young does not mind going into a hostile opposition crowd in the postseason, putting up numbers and getting wins, of course, extending that series to six games after a massive game five there. But Boston moving on, and they are taking on currently, and they trail 1-0, the winner of this series here, and that was Philadelphia defeating Brooklyn 4-1. to Of course, Joel Embiid and James Harden missing a game there in that sweep of a series. Really easy stuff there, of course, for Philadelphia. That's probably a bit of a concern for me. We'll get to that in a second. Tyrese Maxey, the pick of the best. 21.8 points, 5 rebounds, 1.8 assists, 1.5 steals, and 0.3 blocks on a turnover. Shot 47.1 from the field, 50% from deep, and 80% from the free throw line. On the other side, Mr. Consistency, Mr. Durable, and a guy who looked to be probably the fittest player in the postseason so far for me. Mikhail Bridges, 23.5 points, 5.3 rebounds, 4 assists, 0.5 steals and a block, and 0.5 blocks a game on two turnovers. A little to be desired from the field at 42.9%, shot 40% from deep, and 78.3 from the stripe. Again, the real question for me is, you know, they got a win without Harden and Embiid. They've now got another win without Embiid. You look at it, was it too easy a first round for the Sixers and their playoff chances? I just don't know whether you really want to sweep against a team that barely, you know, they lost all their firepower at the trade deadline. They maintained, worked hard to maintain, probably didn't have enough legs under them themselves. And uh, you get the win. 
in four when three games uh, only consisted, well, one game didn't consist of your all-star point guard, your all-NBA level point guard, and the MVP of the NBA. So we'll see how that goes for them. Of course, they currently lead at Boston 1-0 in the second round. So it may not affect them at all. Of course, who is the key piece for me that the Nets need to genuinely contend for a championship? It could have been Kevin Durant. I really think Kevin Durant could have been the guy. Because the roster that we've got right now sitting there for the Nets is a team that can, can, can contend and should contend. They've got second and third options. They've got defenders, they've got shooters, they've got 3 and D guys, they've got rotational pieces. Now they need a leader. Now, who the leader is, I don't know. I don't think it's Damian Lillard. I think you need someone with a good two-way acumen to really contend and get things done here. We will see how it pans out. But for me, they are still just one piece away. We'll see how that one continues to pan out for them. Of course, at the moment, it's really easy, really simple. The um, Maxi is a must-keep for the 76ers. And I think that's really evident. I don't think that's too hard. You know, they've always sort of asking questions about what his value is. Can he stay in the team? Can he be consistent? Well, I think it's really evident at the moment, the way he played in that first round, genuine third option, genuine player that can start, a genuine player who can come off the bench. You've got to let players play and show their worth. A lot of players in this league have been wrote, have been written off. A lot of people have wrote players off this season. And all of a sudden, in the postseason, they're really starting to perform. They're really starting to get stuff done. You can't sit there and just subscribe to the fact that, oh, he's had a bad 10-game stretch. Oh, he's had a bad week. Oh, he's had a bad month. Do some research. Find out about him. Max is a must-keep, no doubt, for Philadelphia and their success. And, of course, got the easy win in the first round. Final first round series was New York and Cleveland. Of course, New York won one currently with Miami, but they did defeat the Cavs in five. Four games to one. Jalen Brunson, the pick of the bunch for me for New York, their most valuable player. 24 points, 4.2 rebounds, 4.8 assists, 2.2 steals and 2.2 blocks on 3.2 turnovers. Shot 43.7 from the field, 29% from deep and 95.5 from the free throw line. For Cleveland, even though it was probably his worst playoff series so far for his career, Donovan Mitchell, 23.2 points, 5 rebounds, 7.2 assists, 2 steals and 0.6 blocks, 3.8 turnovers, not helping his case. And compared to his regular season, some very subpar efficiency from the field. 43.3% there, 28.9 uh, from deep and 72.2 from the free throw line. Brunson, again, proved his case as the most valuable member of the Knicks. And so much was his value for the Knicks throughout that he was given a fifth place MVP vote this season. Again, I think Julius Randle is a better basketball player. But I don't think there's a more valuable player for the Knicks in Jalen Brunson. He had another 30 piece at the time of recording. We're sitting 244 into the second quarter of game one. Lakers, Warriors, the Warriors up 56 53. Watched him in game two uh, against the Heat. Again, pretty much against the Heat bench, which is a bit of a concern. But delivered 30 points, hit big shots, put the team on his back. A cult hero in arguably the biggest basketball city in the world. Great for him, great confidence, good to see him performing. Genuinely, the number one winner of that trade is the Knicks. And considering that everyone they basically got rid of for Brunson was who they were going to get rid of for Mitchell, and they beat Mitchell in the first round, big tick there for New York and a big tick for Jalen Brunson. But they're still one piece away from a championship. I think at the moment the Heat are playing for second spot along with the Knicks. Whoever does that is going to come second in the Eastern Conference. And I just feel that they're one piece away from a championship. Now, does it need to be a leader as someone who's going to step up and be another 20 to 25 point per game scorer? Or does it need to be someone who's going to anchor the defense? I don't know. I think if you had that real complimentary third option to help uh, Mitchell Robinson, we're talking about a completely different team here. I think that's what they're going to need to do. But at the same time, if you're New York, if you've got everyone that's chipping in, you've got RJ Barrett, you could really utilize him on the bench. You've got Quickly, who's doing well. Who knows what could come of it here. But for me, I think it needs to be that defensive-based anchor 
uh, to help a Mitchell Robinson, and all of a sudden their team becomes better. Finally, Donovan Mitchell, a career West postseason. We've seen what he can do. He's probably going to get an All NBA nod, whether it's second or first team. That's yet to be determined. He's had massive scoring runs in Utah. He had the most successful offensive uh, postseason for a Utah player ever uh, in 2021. Most consecutive 30 point playoff games in a single postseason and combined across playoff series and postseasons for the Jazz. We know he can score. But again, the key right now that really hurt Cleveland, they're the slowest team in the league. They wanted to slow things down, played at their pace, funnel through their defense, weren't able to do it. The Knicks got out. And they're not a much of a they're not, you know, a faster team, but they play a faster brand of basketball. So really good to see on that perspective there. But Donovan Mitchell, his worst uh, postseason so far. Uh, big tick in the box for his first season, obviously, in Cleveland. Oh, I got no doubt about that. But it's gonna be the uh, second um, it's gonna be the second year that's really gonna be key for him and helping out the Knicks. My best player in the Eastern Conference in the first round of the playoffs isn't even a question. Jimmy Butler, as I mentioned there, five games, 90, 97, 98 points to end uh, that series there. Massive, massive closeout for him. 50 piece, a 40 piece, getting it done. Series averages of 37.6 points, six rebounds, 4.8 assists, 1.8 steals and 0.4 blocks. 59.7 from the field, 44.4% from deep, 70.8% from the free throw line. Currently at injured with a sprained ankle. Heat 1-1 one one with the Knicks in the second round. No doubt about it for me. The most valuable player of the Eastern Conference so far. Probably the most valuable player of the postseason overall so far. And a guy who, again, is trying to throw his hat in the ring as the best player in the league. We'll see how that continues to pan out for him. Over to the Western Conference. First round matchup, the one seed, the eight seed, getting it done in five games, Denver Nuggets. They defeated Minnesota four to one. The best player for them for me, Nikola Jokic, who just backed up the fact that he was in the MVP conversation again this year. Still think he's uh, should have probably been, uh, probably would have had him fourth on my MVP ballot. There's no doubt about that. But at the same time, he was clearly the second best center in the league for me. Dominant once again, 26.2 points, 12.4 rebounds, 9 assists, 1.2 steals, 0.4 blocks, 2.8 turnovers, shot 48.5 from the field, 50% from deep, and 70.6% from the stripe. Against Minnesota, who's best player and clearly the guy they need to build around right now, Anthony Edwards, 31.6 points, 5 rebounds, 5.2 assists, 1.8 steals, and 2 blocks a game on less than 2 turnovers. A real announcement series there for Anthony Edwards, 48.2% from the field, 34.9% from deep, and 84.6% from the free throw line. I think the real pressure and key right now that's being demonstrated by Denver is that chemistry is key in the postseason no matter what. Really evident and really key with some of the matchups we've seen. Denver have played a lot of games together this year compared to other teams. Denver are a team that's consistently building chemistry. Denver are a team that are always looking to consistently play a starting five lineup all the time, um, you know, that maintains the same amount of players. And come the postseason, when you're firing on all cylinders and you've got everyone who knows everyone in and out like that, of course they're going to play better. I think they can genuinely go all the way if they are fit and healthy, and that's at least to the NBA Finals. It's going to be a big ask for them to win the championship against the East, but to me, there's no doubt about it with the way they're playing. They are the team that can come out of the West. And again, chemistry is key on that one. Anthony Edwards with a breakout season. Uh, Anthony Edwards with a massive breakout series. And no doubt about it for me, has put himself in that top five conversation um, for shooting guards in the league, along with Jimmy Butler, along with Devin Booker, along with Shea Gilgis Alexander, and along with Donovan Mitchell. I don't think it's a case. Um, you know, I don't think it's an argument. I think it's really clear right now. He does have things he needs to iron out in his game. Of course, he's a young guy. But there's no doubt about it. He's in that argument right now. Breakout season for me as an all-star level player. All-NBA team level player. And right now with his player performance, the guy who needs to be numero uno in Minnesota, which leads to my next point. Carl Anthony out of, towns, out of, out of town to another town, whatever you want to call him. He should be gone. 
I don't want to hear any talk about Carl Anthony Towns being even anywhere near the conversation as the greatest shooting big man of all time. At this point, it's ridiculous. He underperforms, he's overpaid, he doesn't deliver, and it's clear right now that Minnesota have a far better player to run with. The contract of Rudy Gobert can eventually sort itself out. I'll need to probably clear him out sooner rather than later. But it could be another case as well for Minnesota of mismanaging a superstar. We'll see what happens there. But for me, you've got to go with, you've got to go with Anthony Edwards. Carl Anthony out of towns, as far as I'm concerned, won't be going much further with his stint there in Minneapolis. You would think, the question is, who do you uh, ship him off to and who, what do you get back for him? Over to our next playoff series, and of course, full time there uh, for the Lakers in their first game of the second round, scraping away with a win against the Golden State Warriors, moving up 1-0 in that best of seven series. But the Lakers defeated Memphis 4-2. Anthony Davis, their best player, an absolute monster at both ends of the floor. 20.8 points, 13.7 rebounds, two assists, 1.3 steals, and 4.3 blocks a game on 2.3 turnovers. 49% 49% from the field, made a third of his three-point attempts and 82.8 from the free throw line. Injury, obviously, Jar Morant, not uh, an ideal exit here for the Grizzlies, but Desmond Bain played a pretty good series across five games. 23.5 points for him, six rebounds, 3.2 assists, 0.5 steals to go with 2.8 turnovers, shot 42.2% from the field, 32% from deep, but 93.1 from the free throw line. Certainly can't complain there. I think Memphis are going to be back next year. A bit of health and a bit of maturity will be something else for them. Of course, there is talk now that Dylan Brooks is all but gone. He's been told by the team he won't return. And there's a little bit of conversation as well to suggest that Jaron Jackson Jr. might be hinting at leaving. But I think they'll be back in thereabouts again next year. Health will help them. Maturity will help them. And, you know, just looking at some of the conversations as well, when you consider how they, um, how they're looking at things, they're owning what they said. They're really wanting to uh, move on with things. And that's one thing I have to give them credit for. Yeah, they talk crap. Um, They got smacked for it. But at the end of the day, they're standing up, putting their hand up and saying, yeah, we said that. We thought we were right. We were wrong. We'll be bigger and better next year. There's not much else. It's better than them denying and, and playing it off as something else. Again, Anthony Davis, nothing short of dominant. You've got to keep getting him touches. And at the time of recording, the player of the game in their first round matchup, 30, 20, and five with four blocks in a rounded way. Massive game there in round in game two. In round in game one of round two. But a nice performance there from Anthony Davis. Um, and again, you've just got to allow him to get more touches. Uh, they talk about players playing off ball and then, you know, players needing the ball in their hands. Well, some players aren't going to perform if you don't give them reps and don't give them possession. Anthony Davis, certainly one of those players. And uh, again, had a massive run as well. LeBron James obviously had a really good series. Um, but, I mean, statistically, it was the worst series he's had since that NBA Finals series uh, in 2011. But Anthony Davis, really big as well. Nothing short of dominant. Keep getting in possession of the basketball. Keep getting in touches. The real question now, obviously, they've showed it in game one. 20-plus uh, free throw advantage to them, despite only winning by five against Golden State. Can they stay healthy? Can they stay consistent? If they can stay healthy and consistent, you've got a team that's got two very good leaders. You've got teams that have some really... Um, you've got a team that's got some really good role players, guys that can really find their niche and warm up on any given day. Again, there's no reason why they can't consider themselves contenders and uh, yeah they're going to put up a really good series against the Warriors um, who they currently lead by one speaking of the Warriors they defeated Sacramento 4-3 to three, uh, and moved on as the 6th lead to the second round again currently trailing 1-0 to the Los Angeles Lakers Steph Curry their leader the most points in a game 7 ever in the playoffs 50 points to close out the series he averaged 33.7 points, 4.9 rebounds, 4.9 assists, 0.9 steals and 0.3 blocks on 3.3 turnovers, 48.8% from the field, 37.8 from deep, 82.9 from the line. He was top scorer in five of seven games and shot over 38% in four uh, in five of those seven games as well. 
Um, had a really good series. Again, going to be one of those things where people see two bad performances and really write off what he did. Was absolutely sensational. For Sacramento, De'Aaron Fox was the pick of the bunch there. 24.7, 27.4 points, 5.4 rebounds, 7.7 .7 assists, 1.2, 2.1 steals, and 0.6 blocks, four turnovers there. Subpar shooting, but De'Aaron Fox really stepping up and stepping out. Clutch player of the year in the newest award as voted uh, by the media in the NBA this season. 42.4% from the field, not ideal. A third of his threes and 75.6% from the free throw line. Ultimately, right now for Sacramento, it's clear they've got the offense, it's clear they've got the players, but what they need are two defensive shooters to truly contend. Once they have those shooters, once they're able to contend, then you start to look at a different team. It's really the defensive end of the ball that lets them down. It's all right to put 110 on the board, all right to put 120 on the board, but you can't concede 130. It's the same issue that Washington had a couple of years ago with John Wall and Bradley Beal and Russell Westbrook. They can put points on the board. There's no issues with those kind of guys putting points on the board. But if you can't stop a shot, then why are you taking the shot? I think Sacramento at this point need to do that. They need to really consider it, look at trying getting some defensive stoppers on their team. That will make them a genuine contender. Um, and that's not to say these guys can't score, but get some guys who, yeah, they might give you nine or 10 points on a given day, but they genuinely are able to shut down the opposition. Honestly, Kevin Looney showed why getting rebounds wins your championships. He had another 20 rebound game today. Unfortunately, didn't get the win uh, at the time of recording. But I thought he was arguably the MVP of this series before Game 7 went down because of his presence on the glass. Second chance points, tough defensive rebounds, key defensive rebounds, really hustled hard. And you're not going to see a team get smashed on the glass and win a championship or win a game or win a playoff round. And again, another prime example of that, Kevon Looney, a guy who's really stepped up, really filled a lot of gaps here for this Warriors team. And he's been doing it for such a long time now. Doesn't get the credit because, of course, you're playing with Steph Curry. You're playing with Clay Thompson. You've played with Kevin Durant. You've got Andrew Wiggins. You've got Jordan Poole. Uh, before them, you had the likes of Andrew Bogut on the team. You had David Lee on the team, David West on the team, Andre Iguodala on the team. Yet, the role he plays, by the time the dynasty is absolutely over and the run is absolutely over for the Warriors, I don't think there's any doubt that Kevon Looney is the guy that would be starting, if not at centre, would be certainly the backup big of this team. Really easy stuff to see there. He brings a lot of value, and uh, there's a reason why the Warriors have clearly kept him. And again, it's evident. Steph Curry wants five rings. He wants a fistful of rings. He's going to have a pretty impressive resume if he has five championships, two regular season MVPs, and two finals MVPs. A lot of Kobe Bryant about that. I got Kobe ahead of him by a fair bit because of the defensive side of the ball. And Steph's really dominant offensively. But that's the kind of conversation we then start seeing people have. And a reasonable conversation at that. Steph wants that fistful of rings. There's no doubt about it. That's what he's really hungry for. And we very well could see it if he continues to play the way we think he can play. Again, 50 points in that Game 7. The most in a Game 7 in NBA playoff history. Um, almost the most to close any game. Almost uh, the most to end a series as well. Again, up with Giannis and Bob Pettit in the finals. Just got to see what goes on. But Steph clearly chasing a fistful of rings. He may have to go through, though. Not only will he be going through the Lakers right now, but he may have to go through the Phoenix Suns as we come to the end of this video here. They defeated the Los Angeles Clippers 4-1. to one, And they were led by Devin Booker who continues to show why he is the best shooting guard in the NBA. First round averages 37.2 points, 5 rebounds, 6.4 assists, 2.6 steals, 1 block a game on 3.2, 3, oh, 3 turnovers a game. But here's where the efficiency factor comes into it. 60.2% from the field, 46.7 from deep, and 85.7 from the free throw line ridiculous numbers from Devin Booker in the first round. On the other side of the ball, Russell Westbrook was the key player to play all five games. 23.6 points, 7.6 rebounds, 7.4 assists, 1.2 steals, 1.4 blocks. Usual numbers from Russ in the turnover department there at four a game. Shooting percentage of 41, uh, three ball percentage of 35.7 and 88% from the line. Through the first round, and they now trail Denver 2-zip, which is what's really interesting out of this, I thought Phoenix were favourites to win the West. Chemistry is key. Health is key. 
for just the way they are playing right now, to me, there was no reason uh, in that first round why Phoenix certainly weren't the favourites to come out of the West. They're going to have to do a amount of work to overcome Denver in the second round. I think they can do that, or even though they're 2-0 down. I think they can do it. But again, the big thing for Denver right now, just the fact that they've got chemistry, they've got reps. But there's no doubt about it, from everything I saw, contributions of Kevin Durant, pre-injury Chris Paul, everything going on with that team, I thought they were the favourites to win the West. I mean, the big question as well is where to in the career of Kawhi Leonard. Torn meniscus following an ACL recovery, which was following a quadricep t- um, tendon tear recovery. That's a lot. And again, that's a big mental hurdle. We obviously know the backstory with his family, his father, and now his sister, of course. There's got to be a lot going on in that guy's mind. But you do have to ask the question, what is next for Kawhi Leonard in his career? Which is unfortunate. He's a top 50 player all time, but he's now entered that Bill Walton realm of all-time greats of what-ifs. Yes, Derek Rose is there. Yes, Penny Hardaway is there. Yes, Grant Hill's there. Uh, of course, Brandon Roy's there. But Kawhi Leonard and Bill Walton are the two. Because what we saw out of them at an elite level won championships and the best player in the league level play. Unquestionable. So we'll see where he goes from here. Hopefully it's up, but it's going to be really interesting to see what goes on. And again, for Devin Booker, the biggest playoff outlier right now. This is a guy who is the number one option that's not getting the focus of the defense. Now, does that necessarily make him the number one option? You can debate it, but I I think it's really clear that he is the number one option and the best player right now for Phoenix. I don't want to hear any of this. He's never been a superstar. He's never been a leader. He's never been the number one option. He's been the best player for the Suns since 2020. He was the best player in 2021. He was the best player for Phoenix in the 2021 finals. He was the best player for Phoenix last year. He was an MVP candidate last year. He's been the best shooting guard for the last two years. He's had a rough year this season, but he's showing why he is who he is. And for me, if you're going to put numbers up by Jordan, there's a reason you're going to be considered to be the biggest playoff outlier. And generally, the biggest playoff outlier is the one that wins the um, wins the game, wins the series, wins the championship. We'll see whether he can help in round two. Of course, overshadowed in all of this is the fact that, surprise, surprise, they've allowed Russell Westbrook to play like Russell Westbrook, and it's paid well, it's paid off for them. Who'd have thought? I'm just saying, before he got to LA and was told to play off the ball and change his role and change his game, different player. Was that guy in Washington? Was that guy in Houston? And was that guy in Oklahoma City? I defy anyone to to contest that. But that's been the wrap on those playoff series in the first round. Thanks for tuning in. My best player in the West was going to be Steph Curry, but just the sheer weight of numbers and performance from Devin Booker has to be my best player in the Western Conference in the first round. 37.2 points, 5 rebounds, 6.4 assists, 2.6. Six steals and a block a game on three turnovers. 60.2% from the field, 46.7% from deep, and 85.7% from the line. The outlier, the best shooting guard in the league. And on his day, one of the five best players in the league right now. A healthy Devin Booker next year is going to be very interesting to contend with. Anyway, guys, that's been me. That's been round one of the 2023 NBA playoffs. I'll catch you at the end of round two, and we'll dive into things in the postseason once again. Thanks for tuning in, guys. I'm out.